This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. We're still on getting free from the tentacles of Babylon. And to be truthful, this could be a coming 100-part series because the tentacles are everywhere. And it is, they, they don't come at you one way, they come at you 10,000 ways. And they have sown up the world. But how many know that the day that I made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior, I ceased being a resident of this world and became a foreigner and a stranger. And I am seeking that city whose builder and maker is God. Babylon doesn't impress me. Only Jesus impresses me. I tell you what, he can... Oh, have you ever read about the new heaven and new earth? There's... You can, your refrigerator is not going to need a light because in this universe, shadows don't exist and light is everywhere. You can seal up a box and that box would be full of light. You don't grow old. And I'm believing food does not have calories. All right. I can't, you almost, you almost can't grasp the new heaven and new earth. A new existence outside of the three heavens. God rolls up the heavens, plural as a scroll. Poof, be gone. He creates a place Lucifer has never been. He creates a place the Illuminati have never been. He creates a place that there has never been a shadow of turning. There has never been evil. There has never been unrighteousness. And he says, I'm going to live with you there forever. Hot dog, who needs Babylon? Okay. Now we're going to pick up in dealing with Babylon. And Babylon are mind benders. They are mind blinders. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And one of the things I'm finding that we're going to be touching on is this not only deals with the world, but how many know that after you get saved, to quote Zig Ziglar, you need a checkup from the neck up, okay? Because your thinking is all wrong. And a lot of the way that we have even built what we call church was before our minds were renewed to the Word. We're still following the Constantinian version of what the assembly should be instead of following the apostolic version of what the assembly would be. And that's a whole other message. And when we come to our conference, we may be doing that to where I may end up, uh, I get a 90-minute slot, I may teach for an hour, and then we may have questions and answers for 30 minutes. Because that's the yeshiva type that went on in the synagogue. Well, why is that so important? Because Rome couldn't keep the church down. And when the Apostle Paul came into a city, they're saying, are you the one who has come here who has turned the world upside down? They had a strength we don't have in this circus that we call the church today. Okay? 
Oh, that's another message, and I'm, I'm going to be preaching some of this in Dallas next week, and it's bubbling out of me. Okay. Starting in verse 3, But if our gospel is veiled or hid, it is veiled from those that are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And he's sharing part of the secret stratagem of the enemy is that 99% of what the enemy does is messing with the matter between your two ears. That when you realize that man is a tripartite being, our spirit is connected to the third heaven, our soul is connected to the second heaven, and everybody knows our bodies are connected to the first heaven, okay? And so they, they do this mind manipulation. That's why the weapons of our warfare are not strong, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, bringing every thought. He didn't say bring in your neighbor. He didn't say bring in the politicians. He didn't say corralling D.C. and bringing them in order. It's the thoughts between our ears. And it has gotten so corrupted that they have allowed to develop the mess that's up there if we're still a government of the people, by the people, and oh, by the way, for the people, okay? When we look at the Greek, nohama in Greek for mind, it means mental perception and thought. That which thinks the mind, the thought of the processes, but what really jumped out at me as mental perception did you know one of the biggest problems that, let's say, a traffic cop has, there's been an accident, and you get 10 witnesses, you're going to get 10 different stories. Because you view that through the matrix of your own perception based upon your own history and that which you had went through. Let's say that you have a biker, all in black leather, riding his chopper, somebody doesn't see him, pulls out and just T-bones him. But if you have somebody that was a witness, let, let's say we're beat up by bikers, that wreck will be that biker's fault. Because your perception is skewed based upon your own mental filter. And so the enemy is constantly working to contaminate that filter so that you cannot perceive reality. When you look at Genesis 1-2, that there was chaos and confusion. Hatohu, habohu. One of, the, one of the definitions of hatohu is unreality. That unreality was released upon creation, was released upon the earth. But when Jesus said, I have come that you might know the truth, and the truth will set you free, one of the definitions for that word truth is reality. I'm come to bring you reality because you cannot perceive right, you cannot see right. You can actually have people being nice to you, and you get offended. And then we have this whole woke generation. I don't know what they're perceiving. They're just looking for a reason to be, to be offended Yet my constitution says I have the right for the pursuit of happiness. It did not say I was guaranteed the right not to be offended. And nobody asked me if I was offended at their offense. It's all this scrambled egg mind stuff that's going on. And blind, blinded, tofluu in Greek, means to blind, to make blind, or to blunt the mental discernment and to darken the mind. So that which we perceive with has been darkened, has been blurred, has been skewed. Now luckily those of us here, by the grace of God, the Holy Spirit got enough light in that we got convicted of our sins and we surrendered to Jesus. Your spirit man was connected to the throne of God in the third heaven, but you still have a lot of junk going on in your mind Wrong paradigms, wrong views, it causes us to even interpret Scripture incorrectly. Come on. Now, I'm going to give you some good news in all this. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. How many know the, 
I've actually heard people say, you know, the devil is waiting to draw in this stuff that mankind has never heard of just to trick everybody in the last days. Stuff we never heard of. Most of them don't know Genesis 6 for Adam, okay? You really start studying Genesis 6 and start putting it in context with the book of Enoch and with history as well as bringing in some other cultures. You've got some freaky deaky stuff going on, okay? Why does it say, no temptation has overtaken you except as such is common to man? When we got to the cross, Jesus says, we're putting a pin in it, and the only thing that you can use to tempt man is what I have revealed from Genesis to Malachi. That's it. You cannot pull any other stuff. You have done set the track record. You have done released your hordes. You have done all these things. And now it stops. You're stuck here. You can't pull anything out of your magic bag of tricks that no one has ever seen before. And so what the devil said is, I'll make them stupid to history. I'll cause them to forget. Oh, Genesis 6 was just about the sons of Seth. Yeah, right. Okay. Guys, in the warfare that's raging before us, the workers of darkness are limited. Everything in the First Testament, which to include Genesis 6, is this simply going to be a rehash? All the enemy can do is rehash, relabel, and represent. That's it. And if you know your Bible, it's kind of like watching politics today. It's the same stupid ideas, and this time we're going to call it the Freedom Act as we take away all your rights. And we bind you up so that you can't point out how corrupt and criminal that we are. And we're going to sell it that way. Anyone whose perception is right can see through the veneer and say it's the same old pablum over and over again. And it's to help corporations, it's to help the crooked keep making money off of our backs. See, it's the same old thing, just over and over and over again. Guys, modern transhumanism is literally the remaking of Genesis 6. Did you know the atom bomb was a part of that? The book of Enoch tells us that the Nephilim, the direct, the first descendant sons of the watchers, God caused them to war amongst themselves. Now, when you look at uh, other ancient cultures like in India, they actually document those wars and they document nuclear warfare. And there is historic proof. Well, one of the things that we found in, in the test that we did for the atomic bombs in the desert is you got this sea of glass, okay, that was, that was melted in a unique way in heat sometimes a hundred times hotter than the sun, okay? It gives a very distinct type of, of, of makeup. And did you know that there is ancient Egyptian jewelry made from atomic glass? It's from the antediluvian age. All this stuff, it's all, there's nothing new under the sun. Solomon didn't know just how exactly correct he was sharing all this. Jesus warns us in Matthew 24, 36 through 39. But of that hour, and, or that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but only my Father. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And did not know until the flood came and took them away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, 
to Jewish ears, they understood Genesis 6. They understood what happened with the genetic manipulation, advanced technology, as well as for 120 years, Noah warned them of something they had never seen coming, and it was a type of judgment of God that they could not dream possible, kind of like the second coming of Jesus, and that all the armies of the world cannot hold up against the brightness of his coming. They were warning. He was warning them, and they, they, didn't, they wouldn't want to listen. We're being enhanced. We're becoming something greater. I can now lift up the back of my Buick when Martha changes the tire. They've tripled my IQ. I'm getting stronger, but at the same time, their minds are getting darker and darker and darker, darker. Have you noticed how the world leaders, their minds are getting darker and darker and darker? Well, they boast they're going to do great things for us behind the scenes at Davos and many other places. They're planning our demise. They just want enough of us around to be their servants where they can control. How many know, you know, eight billion people are hard to control? Much less nine or ten. They want to reduce it to under a billion. That way it's a whole lot easier to control. But still enough of us that we can make their cars, make their jets. Oh, come on now. Have you been watching some of the garbage that's coming out of the EU of the, of the future cities? that we've got to earn our calories, earn our food, but only, and we gotta walk everywhere we go, otherwise we don't go. And, we, and when, when we do walk, we gotta calculate in those calories so that we get more food that day while the rich have limousines that they drive around in. I mean, this, this is actually a cartoon thing promoted by the EU, the World Economic Forum, about the future smart cities. I think they're the future dumb cities. They're promoting all that. Their minds are getting darker and darker by the minute. Genesis 6, 5 reminds us, and the, Lord, and the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. That's all they think of. That they are stuck on whatever perversity that has taken hold of them, and that just drives every single thought continually. Now I want to read what Adam Clark has said about that time period. He said, the wickedness of man was great. What an awful character does God give the individuals of the antediluvian world. They were flesh, holy, sensual, desires of the mind, overwhelmed and lost in desire of the flesh, their souls no longer discerning their high destiny, but ever minding earthly things, so that they were sensualized, brutalized, and became flesh, and they were in a state of complete wickedness, of complete corruption, of all unrighteousness without. Then he goes on to say there was neither science or religion, and I, I disagree with him on that. There was perverted science, if you understand what was going on with the watchers, and their religion was transhumanism back then, of I shall become a god, and I will kill anybody and kill anything that stands in my way of my becoming. It does not sound like world leaders today. He goes on to say, and the wicked uh, were, were multiplied. It was continually increasing and multiplied. And then he goes on to even talk about how that there was not only cruelty in the lower class of the citizenry, but cruelty and oppression from among the higher class. In other words, the higher class were lording it over the lower class, and they governed by cruelty and oppression. Does that sound familiar? Everything as in the days of Noah. Now, one of the points that Adam Clark does make is the concept of this lower and higher class. This is the earmark of the world elite that will either create a pandemic, cause war and famine, Topple governments. We're actually seeing, guys, a war right now on planet Earth that, from my point of view, the, fa the flames were fanned by NATO, that were fanned by America. 
And Putin took the bait because there was something going on that crossed the line. Now, is he right in all that they're doing? No. How many know war is ugly? War is one of the worst things that man has ever created. And it creates untold harm. But we need to know that what is really going on, we're not being told. We are not being told. Because it's world leaders that have a game afoot. And some believe when you look at not necessarily Putin, but what's going on in Russia today, it's the last bastion of protecting Christianity on planet Earth. They're not with the program with the LGBT thing or the abortion or all these different things. They're actually, the, they're, the, those in leadership are trying to stand up for Christian morals. Now this is separate from Putin. I think he still thinks like KGB. It's kind of hard for you to bypass your, your upbringing and most of your career. But there's more going on than we realize. And we're not being told the truth. I think that's one of the reasons why Turkey basically called NATO's gambit, saying you want us to give them our MiGs so that you make us combatants in this theater of war? Here's what we'll do. We're going to send them to Ryan, Ranstein Air Force Base in Germany, give them to the U.S. You can go ahead and slap American flags on them, and then you give them to the Ukraine. America says, we're not doing that. It's because they're willing to throw other nations under the bus for their agenda. Never mistake Mystery Babylon is never your friend. It will throw you under the bus in a heartbeat. I don't care how far up the rung you think you are. And most of our world leaders think that they're high on the rung. They're still puppets in the hands of the puppet masters that can do away with them tomorrow and never miss a beat. Okay. But there's this darkening going on that we're seeing, we're seeing it in our universities, we're seeing it in public. You know, I got a feeling, if our evening news told us half the things that was going on in Springfield, Missouri, just half of the crime, nobody would shop there. We'd start having everybody going to Walmart with AR-15 strapped across their chest. What are you doing? I'm getting ready to go shopping. Because <laughs> I really know what's going on. All of that is, all, even all that's filtered, guys. The only truth that you're going to get in this world is between these two pieces of leather right here. This is truth. But our perception of the body of Christ has been darkened too. Because how the enemy works, if he can alter the perception of, of the lost, and we used to be lost when we get saved, it doesn't necessarily alter the perception that we have. That was one of the problems that Moses had with the children of Israel. They kept on thinking like Egyptians after they were delivered from Egypt. They missed the garlic, they missed the leeks. The uh, first chance they had, they created a golden calf just like the one they used to make. For the Egyptians, and they called that Yahweh because they saw this nation of great power that, that subjugated us. This was their God and had the audacity to call it Yahweh. And God says, you better never do that to me again. So what happens in Israel's history? Southern tribes separate from the northern tribes, and I'll be darned if the northern tribes didn't create two of them. And said, you go there during the feast and worship, don't go down south. Kind of like the church, I heard one prophet say, yeah, two golden calves have been made in our day. It's called the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, but moving on, okay? Things to make you go, hmm. But I want to deal with some of these darkened perceptions in our, and the, the skewing of our paradigms from the kingdom to something less. How many have heard of the entertainment church? We're following after the model of Constantine. Now, the only thing that we don't do is under Constantine, when he built buildings for the Roman Catholic Church to meet, y'all stood up and I got to sit down and teach. Somehow or another, in the entertainment part of it, this has all gotten switched around. But they, when he said, let us have nothing in common with the Jews, they separated us 
not only from Judaism, but from the entire Old Testament. And they separated us from the synagogue model that Ezra and Nehemiah had put together to help keep the Jewish people as a whole together under the rule of Babylon. Okay? And what's interesting is they always built the synagogues outside the city saying, we're set apart, we're set apart, we're set apart. But a synagogue was three things. A house of study, a house of worship, and a house of fellowship. One of the things God was telling me today, and then, oh gosh, I knew it was true. Could you imagine if the up and coming, one of the movements in the church was something new called deliverance. There were demons, and we had to cast them out. So during church, we would, we would promote this thing like WWE wrestling. And in this corner, this guy that used to be Phil, that got involved in the, in the cult of Dionysus and did not do a ritual right, and now he is known as the man who cannot be bound, the man that's wild, the madman of Gadara. And over in this corner, we have a new traveling rabbi. People say that he can preach with authority and power. So today, we're going to see what he has. Jesus of Nazareth. Now, folks, we're watching Jesus beginning to move into the, into the arena of engagement. Will he take holy water? We don't know what that was. It didn't exist in the second temple period, but... John thought it was a good idea, but let's move on. Is it holy water? Is he going to take the Torah scroll and hit him upside the head? We're just waiting in anticipation. Jesus walks up and says, what's your name? I'm Legion. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's Jesus. Already got more out of him than we did in the interviews. Let's go to the filming of the interviews. Phil, what have you got to say? <laughs> now let's go back to the conflict. Jesus said, come out. They asked if they could go into the pigs. Bill, there goes dinner. Guess we'll have to opt for fried chicken today. Can you imagine that? That's just about what we have done with church. We're not being taught the word. We're giving motivational speeches. I would just feel better about yourself. You can't feel better until you realize you're a sinner. You need a Savior. God shows you where the enemy has gotten in. You run to the altar and you repent. And God fills that area and it's called something called relief. The burden of sin is lifted. It has to be a center of study is what a church is supposed to be. We don't engage them anymore. We've lost them all. Did you know in the synagogue model that there was 100% participation by the males? Because they were learning how to be the patriarch of their household and the head of their household. In fact, all the guys sat down in front. The women were up in the balcony because from, from Jewish reckoning and Hebraic reckoning, it was the sin of Adam. So the woman was less sinful less guilty so she was set up there because the guy needed the instruction because when he should have moved he didn't say a word when he should have moved in authority he sat there and did nothing and actually the chairs would be folded would be turned this way and the center aisle would be open because after the rabbi would teach for an hour maybe he may spend the next couple of hours debating among the men and teaching and answering questions and, 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 and hashing out things. All the men were engaged. The Greco-Roman mindset were entertained. The men have no place. We have basically neutered spiritually the men. And the ones that do stay in church... The first time something goes wrong with the pastor, they have this inert anger that they were usurped in their husbandly duties as far as being the head of the household by the local pastor, and they raise up an anger to kick him out. 
instead of him being a force to empower them to be head of, head of their households. And so we tried. I, I remember years ago when we still had our offices down in Marshfield. And back then, you know, I filled up a cassette, 90-minute cassette tape. There were 90 minutes on that cassette tape. There was no need to waste any tape, okay? I preached 90-minute sermons. And this pastor was, came in and was very braggadocious that their entire service was 90 minutes. How in the world? That's right down with, you know, the basic Baptist sermon, three points in a poem. And then a sad story about old yeller so we can get people to the altar to get saved, rededicate, whatever. It needs to be a training center, not an entertainment center. Our praise and worship is not for our entertainment. It is not so that you can forget about all the ugly stuff that you're going through. Just for a minute I'd like to forget. Oh, sing the songs that I like. I remember years ago, Lester Summerall talked about this one woman that uh, she didn't like the new Hosanna songs, you know, that were actually directly out of the Bible, that were the Psalms set to music. And she gets up with a prophetic word, thus saith the Lord, sing me those old songs, saith the Lord. I don't like them new songs. Talk about prophesying out of your own spirit, because it was what she wanted Praise and worship is not for our entertainment. It's for God's joy. It's for God to enjoy. Now what happens is there's a divine exchange. When his presence comes in, I don't forget my burdens. Now that he's here, I cast them on him because he loves me. But the praise and the worship brings him in to allow the casting. That's how you get free. And we've done it. Boy, it's got to have that funky beat. And we've got to have the lights, you know. Got to turn on the fog machine so that we can call it the glory of God coming in. And if the band doesn't have the right beat, guys, I've been, when I was in the military, I was all over okay. I've been in home fellowships. Nobody knew how to play a guitar. That would, that would be all that we had. And so they would pick up a Hosanna tape and just stick it in. And everybody started worshiping God off a of Hosanna tape. And the presence of God would come in that people would be laying on their faces before God. But now unless we have a praise and worship team that is album worthy, we just can't get into it. That's because we're an entertainment church. True fellowship, a house of fellowship. In fellowship, it strengthens your walk with God. We're doing it wrong if it turns to be a place for discord within the assembly. Everybody uses the time of fellowship to talk about how, how they're upset with things going on at church, doing this at church, doing that at church, and how these be this way and that way. And blah, 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 blah. You know, when I was Baptist, we're talking way back in ancient history. Okay, I was a teenager. I, was stud I, I surrendered at 13 was studying to be a Baptist preacher. And one of the going jokes, which was actually reality, but we would wrap a joke around it. You know, how, how, do, how, do, how do Baptists multiply? Well, we multiply by division. That's exactly the way it is. Church gets mad, there's a church split, now you have two churches. Those two churches get mad at each other and they split. Then they bring in people that are on their side. That was the way of multiplication in many Baptist churches. Well, the going axiom is that the will of God can only be overturned by two-thirds majority vote because we are a democratic church. The church is not a democracy, it's a theocracy. The only time I ever see voting by the congregation in the New Testament is the apostles said, listen, we need to have time to seek the face of God, to get into the Word, 
And so we need waiters in the church, those to check on the widows and the orphans, those to wipe runny noses, those to do a lot of the basic business of church, make sure that they have what they need, and to wait on tables when we have church service. That's it. Now, not only do we not just do that, but give me the definition of the modern deacon. The modern deacon is the board that keeps the pastor in line. Where is that in the Word? It's not there. It's not there. But yet we constantly are voting at business meetings about what we want, what we want, what we want, what we want. And we've never been taught you. If, if you are going to vote and you're going to have this kind of system, your responsibility is to hit your knees before God and you find out what God wants and you better have vote what God wants because he will hold you responsible for that vote. And then we have a lot of people in those systems that vote what their flesh wants. And the next thing you know, God is beginning to judge them because they were going against the will of God, trying to wonder how the devil got in. Oh, dear. So, oh, you went to messing. I mess all the time. That's okay. Here's my new favorite one. The ragtag church that needs Jesus to come back and save them with the rapture before it's too late and they get their heads beat in. That's the way from the beginning of Darbyism till probably in the last five or, or ten years, even in spite of what happened in World War II, the way they preached the rapture cost the church Europe. Because Jesus is going to come back before it gets too bad. Because, you know, the Lord knows you can only take so much. So come to the altar and accept Jesus. And you're not going to have to worry about that because we're all going to get out of here. And then World War II happened. Connie Ten Boom begged the church, quit preaching that way. Because you destroyed the faith of Christians in all of Europe. In China, it was preached that way, and then communists started taking over. And there were two groups, those that believed that, and those that believed that they were going to have to go through the tribulation period. And when Jesus says, listen, when you see the abomination coming, run to the mountains, it was good enough for them in Jerusalem, it's good enough for us. And those Chinese ran to the mountains. All the pre-tribbers that preached the pre-trib that way were all killed by the communists. The only reason there is Christianity in China are for those who ran to the mountains because they said, you know what, we might, it may not be exactly the way everybody's preaching it. Their paradigm got them killed. You see, if the enemy, art of war by Sun Tzu, okay, he said if you can get the enemy defeated before you ever have to lift up the sword, you've already won the war. It's a mind game. Before you ever engage on the actual battle, you play these mind games on them. You get their paradigms wrong. You get their mindsets and their perceptions wrong. And they will surrender before they ever start. Do you know America did that when we, when we went into, into Baghdad and Iraq? <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm ex-military. Uh, I was stationed at the headquarters of 3rd Infantry Division in Würzburg, Germany. And over there, they still had the old camouflage that was more set for green, right? Where they have the desert ones now. And so what the military did is they only had a limited number of the, of the desert kind that were given to the elite special forces. Everybody else had the old camo. And so they started spreading rumors all around Iraq the most deadly of all American soldiers are the ones that wear the green camouflage. Be afraid. Be very afraid. So they weren't afraid of those that wore the desert uniforms who skillfully carved them into pieces while they ran from the guys who may not have even been trained in war. They were admin clerks or whatever wearing regular oh, the, the old green camouflage saying, those are the guys and they would run 
tactics of the enemy. I want to change your paradigm because we're looking at the end times all wrong. Are you ready? Let's go to Matthew chapter 16. And did you know that when Jesus was giving this, he wasn't just speaking to his disciples because they weren't going to face what we fight, what we're going to face. He was actually speaking ahead in time and talking to us right now. Starting in verse 13, and when Jesus came to the regions of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, I the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, and others one of the prophets. In other words, some of them were into reincarnation. Isn't that funny? And Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, and there was like a play, pebbles, pebbles. I'm going to set pebbles on a rock. Because Peter means pebbles. Okay. So we're going to put pebbles on a rock. The rock of what? The revelation of what he just said. Okay. And I will build my assembly, those that have been called out, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, let's set this in context. Caesarea Philippi. Jesus takes them out of the way. He takes them to Mount Hermon. And he says, who does everybody say that I am? Why did he say that? He was announcing to the watchers and the principalities and powers, I'm the one that's going to fix this thing. And the Holy Spirit just leapt on Peter. And, you know, Peter with his foot and mouth disease, this is one of the times he didn't have to put his foot out of his mouth. It's like, the Lord gave me a treat because I got it right. <laughs> I feel like Peter so much. He takes him to Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon had the gate or the entrance to Hades. It had a grotto to Pan. It was the place where the watchers came down and planned to corrupt the day of humanity. In fact, there's an ancient plaque written in Hebrew and other languages that's now in the British Museum they took from Mount Hermon that said this is the spot where the watchers planned to corrupt humanity from the ancient world. Right there. Ground zero. So you have the gates of hell, Hades, all of Hades. You got the watchers. But let's not stop there. On the top of it, we have the fortress of Nimrod. So we have the son of perdition who's going to come back, the one who was, is not, but shall be. His fortress right there. And if you look at the topography of Mount Hermon on the one far side, there's a, the topography literally makes a goat's head, which reminds us of Azazel. This, and in fact, when you look in the Hebrew, when they sent out the scapegoat, they would literally, they would send out and said, this one is for Azazel. They translate in that passage, Azazel, a scapegoat. So that may be the very place that Azazel was imprisoned, one of those watchers. He takes them there, and Jesus makes a promise that transcends time that speaks to us today. He said there's coming a time when the full council of hell is going to be reconstituted. That the watchers are going to be released that all the principalities and powers and the watchers and all the priesthood of darkness and even the son of perdition himself is going to be revealed, but it's not going to prevail against the church. Okay? Now the way that we read that is defensively. Oh, they're all coming out of the woodwork, Brother Mike. They're all coming in the last days. Oh, I don't know if we're going to be able to survive only by the grace of God. Come Jesus, come Jesus, come Jesus, come Jesus, come Jesus. Defensive. Holding out until I can. And I just hope before my last breath that Jesus comes back and delivers me. That is not what it's saying there. Why did Jesus ask them, who do men say that I am? There. Why did he ask them there? Because there was a promise given to Abraham 
about a coming day. Oh. Let's go to Genesis 22. I want you to see this out of your own Bible. Now let's set the situation. Abraham takes Isaac up to Mount Moriah. He was told to sacrifice him there. That later became Mount Zion, where the temple was built. That exact same spot is where Jesus hung on the cross. And I think if we, if we could do Google mapping the day that Jesus was crucified and Google mapping at the time that, that Abraham prepared the altar, I think they would line up to the exact same spot. God is just that meticulous, okay? He is willing to sacrifice his only son. Now going up, he prophesied to Isaac saying, God will provide a lamb. Very specific, God is going to provide a lamb. Now when you read the story, the angel stops him, and there is a ram with its horns caught in the thicket. And so every sage of Israel since Moses has looked at that story and said, there's a lamb coming. There's a lamb coming that is a lamb of God. What happened when Jesus broke forth in his ministry and the only true prophet at that time? And that, and that fact, when you line him up with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, according to Jesus, John was the greatest prophet that ever lived. Why? Because he stood on the banks of an old river and he said, there's the Lamb of God that will take away the sins of the world. So the sacrificing of Isaac is directly connected because what he did, he opened the door for God to provide his lamb because he was willing to give his only son of promise so that the Almighty, they're in covenant, they're in blood covenant. Whatever your covenant partner asks of you, he has to be willing to do himself. And so... When the angel Lord, which I believe is Jesus, spoke to Abraham that day, listen to what he said. Verse, starting with verse 15. And the angel Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven, saying, By myself I have sworn, saith the Lord, because you have done this thing and you have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you, multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. I want you to stop right there. We need to start calling everybody sandy and stars. Because we are the stars, we are the sand. That we come in by Abraham. All the nations of the earth... All the nations of the earth, not just Israel, everybody. So we're the sand and we're the stars. And he said, not only are they going to be your descendants, your descendants shall possess the gate, not gates of the enemy. The gate. There's just one gate. And it's at Mount Hermon. Just one gate. Because my enemy is not the Russians. My enemy is not even the elite. My enemy... Is not North Korea. My enemy is the council of hell. <coughs> now, what did, what did Jesus promise to Abraham? Your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. That is not a defensive move. That is an offensive move. That we drive them back to their gates and we take it before Jesus comes back. Oh, you mean I'm not going to be a ragtag bride with all her teeth knocked out but one tooth? Wearing rags, waiting for Jesus to come back? Oh. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. I don't know about you, but I'm getting happy. We need to change how we view things. You know, he's talking about a husband and wife and how the husband's supposed to take care of the wife. 
And I know this may uh, really cramp some people, but I like it when my wife gets jewelry. In our household, we call them fancy doodle wops. Okay. I like to buy her pretty stuff to wear. You know why? Because to me, I'm not judged by a my Armani suit. I'm judged, I'm supposed to be judged by how well I take care of her. Because it's a representation of Christ in the church. Okay. And in that context, he said, he goes, no, I'm not just talking about husband and wife, I'm talking about a mystery. That he might present to himself a ragtag, half-beat-up church. What, what, what does your Bible say? Glorious. Glorious church. I tell you what, there's been times that Mary has blinged out that she has taken my breath away. And to me, that's glorious. Okay? And any husband that doesn't do that does something wrong with you. Okay? Not having spot nor wrinkle nor any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. I like the way the Amplified translates that he may present the church to himself in glorious splendor. Okay? Now, when you look at glorious in the Greek, in doxos, it means held in good or in great esteem of high repute, lustrous, honorable, esteemed. And when I looked in the reader's lexicon of the apostolic fathers to see how they interpreted this word, they added another word besides honored and distinguished, eminent. Eminent. Well, how does that add to it? Now, Webster's Dictionary means eminent means exhibiting eminence. Okay. What does it mean to be a tomato? It means to be a tomato, I guess. But especially in standing above others in some quality or position. Has anybody ever heard of eminent domain? That's where the government comes in and says, I don't care how long this land has been in your family, we're taking it. An eminent church who went to the gates of hell and said, I don't care how long you had this, we're taking it for Jesus. Is your head hurting yet? Oh, i got to change my paradigm, yeah. But see, the other one was easy believism. I'm not going to have to grow. I'm not going to have to do anything except to make sure that my blessed assurance finds my pew in the church. And woe be to anybody who gets my spot. I remember years ago I saw a cartoon... And you see this old woman, she's sitting there with her Bible and she's looking like this. And there's a new family that came to church that's sitting in her spot. Sister Sally's trying to decide whether she's either going to flog them or welcome them. Because <laughs> that's her spot. And just hold out to the end. Let me tell you something. When the remnant... The glorious church is taken up by Jesus. It's going to be a relief on the devil. That we have grown as much as that we can grow. That we have been like Navy SEALs that we hold the line and we do not break ranks. I heard one preacher years ago said the two witnesses were always arguing, you know, is it going to be Moses? Is it going to be whatever? And he said... How about the Jewish body and the Gentile body being witnesses? Whew. Calling down fire. What did you do to Jimmy? I got rid of some of them Nephilim today. I'm just saying we need to go back and re-examine a lot of our paradigms because we have skewed them. And I don't think that we fully understand the book of Revelation yet. And the fact that it repeats itself at least three times, each time from a different view. And then we tried to translate that into seven years. Now it's three and a half years, where some of it may have gone over the last 2,000 years. 
We've got to redo our thinking, but this is what I do know. Jesus is coming back for a church that is holy, that is powerful, that is glorious, that is imminent, that knows how to move in the power of God and can stand up to the, the onslaught of the sun or perdition and hold their ground. He may be the foundation stone of Mystery Babylon, but I serve a different cornerstone. The builders rejected him, but not God. God has been building on that cornerstone ever since Abraham was willing to offer up Isaac. Oh, man. But you know what that does? That puts responsibility on us. That I got to get rid of old, poor, pitiful me and learn how to be that victorious church. That I've got to change this mindset so that I'm not defeated before I even get up out of my chair. To let the Holy Spirit do a checkup from the neck up on me. To align me with the kingdom. The moment he aligns you with the kingdom, kingdom power flows. But God cannot empower a lie. God cannot empower a falsehood. God cannot empower a false perception. Jesus came to bring reality, and that reality will set you free because it lines you up with heaven. Now, Father, we ask today that you would unscramble our eggs, if you will, that the enemy has worked hard causing us to see things wrong. He's used our childhood. He's used our adulthood. He's used things that have gone on with us. And we have the right to call them lies. They were unjust. They were untrue. Give us eyes to see. Let us be that Laodicean church that we buy from you. Your eyes have so that we can see through your eyes. So that we can walk in your principles. And to be that church without spot and a wrinkle. Lord, don't let us rest until the change occurs and the power comes, we ask. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of the end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.